Now this other part of this brain, this posterior part that I described as being like a separate brain, is the cerebellum. And there are two hemispheres with a convoluted surface, a little bit different than the surface of the cerebrum. But this provides involuntary coordination of body movements. So as we learn movement, we kind of shuffle the responsibility for that movement to that posterior portion of the brain, uh, to the cerebellum. So when we're learning to walk, we have to really think about it. But once we've got that learned activity, then the cerebellum takes over. Same thing with riding a bicycle. You have to think about it for a while until you get back to where you're uh, so the cerebellum learns how to maintain everything so you stay upright and your legs move and all of that. You don't think about every pedal movement that you make. You just tell the cerebellum, pedal, now. Yeah. So that's what this part of the brain does. It controls planned movement. So I've got my um, pre-central gyrus up here, which tells me, tells my body, I'm going to go for a walk, or it initiates walking, but it sends the signal down there that makes sure I swing my arms in the right way, and I move my feet in the right way, etc., etc. This is the cerebellum separated out, and it's got two cerebral hemispheres. I'm not going to worry about the vermis, but again, it does have a lot to do with um, voluntary muscle contractions and movements that just keep us on balance. It also has a bit to do with our sense of equilibrium, or our sense of balance, as it were. Now, the, I told you it had a convoluted structure. It is a little bit different, and we call this pattern of gray and white matter the arbor vitae, or tree of life. And you can see that it looks like we've got tree branches and then leaves coming off of it. So if I were to ask you which part of the brain has a pattern of gray and white matter called the arbor vitae, you should be able to see or say cerebellum. Because this is um, the home of our thoughts, our personality, the regulation of everything in our body, we have a lot of protection of the central nervous system. Uh, scalp and skin, that's actually just a thick layer of leather around our, our skull. Our skull being rounded in shape is actually very strong and uh, not susceptible to easy breakage. We have layers of tissue inside called the meninges and these are the key emitter, this very tough kind of uh, fibrous tissue, we have, or not the key emitter, the dura mater is a tough fibrous tissue. We've got the key emitter that's on the surface of the skin. Between these, we have spinal fluid, and we have something called the blood-brain barrier. And we mentioned the blood-brain barrier in another presentation where we were talking about the glia. So we actually have quite a bit of barrier between the brain and the external environment. Even hair can be considered a production, although some of us have a little less hair than others. Now the meninges, and in terms of remembering meninges, this is going to sound terrible, but there were a couple of parents killed by some brothers called the Menendez brothers, and they shot them in the head. And when I think of how the bullet passed, I think of the Meninges, or Menendez brothers. But the Meninges, there is the Dura Major, which is double-layered external 
it is strong, it's attached to the skull and covers the outer part of the brain. It has folds which will go into areas and separate parts of the brain. So when we go in that longitudinal fissure, which separates right and left hemispheres, we have a fold of dura mater that goes down in there as well. We have the arachnoid layer, which is web-like. It looks very spider-webby, and that's the middle layer. And we have the pia mater, which is the internal layer which actually comes to the surface of the brain. So if you look at this, this white stuff, that's the dura mater, and you can see that it has extensions that go in between the cerebral hemispheres, separates the cerebral or cerebrum from the cerebellum as well. On the surface, this light shiny area, that is the pia mater. And if you look down here, there's sort of some spider web looking stuff. That's the arachnoid. We also have cerebral spinal fluid, which is kind of like plasma, and it's formed in the choroid plexus. And our brain floats in this material. Um, so the fluid actually helps lighten the brain, as it were, to keep it from pressing on the base of the skull. Um, this fluid is formed by the choroid plexus. It acts as a watery cushion, so you can sit and you can go like that at a rock concert and your brain's not just going to slosh around and bang around in there. And it is circulated through the ventricles, the central canal of the spinal cord, and it gets reabsorbed later on. Um, it is a, absorbed actually by a structure called the arachnoid villi. And so we need a balance between what is put out by the choroid plexus and what is released or reabsorbed by the arachnoid villi. If we had some damage to the arachnoid villi, what would happen is we could build up excessive pressure because we would have additional cerebral spinal fluid. And some people in this situation would have a shunt put in. And so, these ventricles, these are hollow areas in the brain, are filled with cerebral spinal fluid. Also, it surrounds the external part of the brain. So you can see here, the brain just floating in this fluid. It passes down and out, all the way down the spinal cord, so we are able to sample cerebral spinal fluid by doing the lumbar puncture. Now, this is a baby which did not have uh, the arachnoid villi working properly. Fortunately, when it happens in a baby, they have um, still soft spots in the skull which allow expansion of the skull. So this would need to have this child would need to have a shunt put in to allow the cerebral spinal fluid to drain properly. The blood-brain barrier. Um, we need to protect the brain. We try to keep it from getting contaminated by chemicals, or our body does. But there are some chemicals, some structures, that uh, some substances that can get past the brain. So fats and fat-soluble molecules. So the propellant in spray paint is fat-soluble. So some people can huff. Respiratory gases. So carbon dioxide and oxygen pass through that just fine, which is good because our brain needs oxygen. And having to regulate that through a blood-brain barrier would be difficult. Alcohol, nicotine, pass right through the blood-brain barrier, so they work um, you know, very quickly. Anesthetics will pass through. However, substances with larger molecular weights, like some antibiotics, don't go through the blood-brain barrier. So it's very hard when someone has an infection in the brain 
to be able to treat that with antibiotics. You have to actually inject substances into the cerebral spinal fluid to be carried through and take care of an infection like that. So that takes care of our basic information on the central nervous system. And we'll have, there are several other presentations called covering the peripheral nervous system, uh, reflexes, cells. So be sure to watch all of those so that you understand this material. Thank you.